Welcome everyone to Value Investing Live. I'm pleased to welcome our guest this week, David Dietz, Managing Principal and Senior Portfolio Strategist at PPAC Private Wealth Management. He last joined us in October of 2020. Um, if you missed that presentation, there is a copy of it here on YouTube as well as on Guru Focus. Um, as always, post your questions in the live chat throughout the presentation. And also, please let us know where you're viewing from. We do love to see those international audience members out there. Without any further ado, I will hand things over to David. Hey, thank you so much, Sydney. It's a distinct honor for us to uh, be uh, have our second appearance here on one of these webinars with uh, Guru Focus. And we also had the distinct honor several years ago to be out in Omaha with one of the Guru Focus's live seminars. Uh, we're going to be talking about value opportunities today. We're coming to you from beautiful downtown Summit, New Jersey. Um, we couldn't do what we do here in PPAC Summit office without the help of our distinguished colleague, uh, that would be Fritz Schoenhardt. We're going to be team tagging you a little bit today. He is a managing director and portfolio manager uh, with us. He came to us from that uh, small little firm uh, in the next city over, Goldman Sachs, where he was a vice president in the private wealth management division, works with uh, the people that uh, uh, are the ultra high net worth category, the institutional clients. He's also got a great tax background, having worked uh, as a tax associate with Grant Thornton. He, distinct, he uh, graduated from the University of Notre Dame in 2011 with a bachelor's in what else? Finance. And also got that MS in taxation uh, from Baruch College and also is proud to be a CFA charter holder. Um, uh, so, you know, people say, well, why PPAC uh, as opposed to anyone else? You know, just very briefly, what we're all about is adhering to those highest fiduciary standards. Uh, we are part of a much larger institution, uh, PPAC Gladstone Bank. Um, our assets under management and supervision here in the Wealth Management Division now exceed over $11 billion. Uh, We're not just all about uh, investing, uh, which we do customize for each of our clients, but we also are big believers in holistic financial planning. Our clientele tends to be individuals, nonprofits, small institutions. And of course, we never forget, it's not what you make, but what you, what you make after paying Uncle Sam and transparency, really focusing on individual securities to the extent possible is part of uh, what we do. Um, at this point, I want to turn it over to Fritz to talk a little bit about the investment process here. Thank you, David, um, and uh, you know, thank you very much for for uh, letting me join you here today. Um, so, you know, the equity investment process that we employ, you know, we seek out those companies that uh, you know, with their definable and sustainable competitive advantages, um, you know, can provide superior and long term opportunities. And we really look at you know both the qualitative and quantitative uh, factors. And on the qualitative side, you know, those companies that have brand strength, superior management, um, you know, efficiencies of scale. Uh, combined with on the quantitative side, you know, we look at, you know, you know their earnings power, their growth rate, cash flow, and, and uh, strong revenue growth. And we look at that to kind of help inform our equity investment process and, and kind of build portfolios with our, for our clients. Um, and so it really starts, uh, you know, with the broad universe of about 2,500 U.S. stocks and ADRs. You know, we kind of look at that through the first lens of, you know, seasoned management, um, financial strength, and a competitive advantage. You know, we filter that through and we get to then start identifying companies that we think are, you know, attractive and undervalued relative to, you know, their historical averages and market parameters uh, and peer group. And then lastly, we look for those stocks that, uh, you know, in that smaller grouping, you know, that there's some catalyst for, for a drive higher in the stock price. And, you know, essentially we get down to about a portfolio of 35, 30 to 50 stocks uh, that you know, we think uh, you know, present a, a good opportunity for long-term investors um, and is broadly diversified. Back to you, David. Hey, thanks, uh, Fritz. So you know, let's talk just a little bit about what we think a value investing is. Value investing to us is trying to get the most profits from a company with the least investment outlay. Um, a value investor carefully analyzes for each dollar laid out, um, What's the most dollars of profits, cash flow, sales, and um, cash flow uh, you'll be entitled to? 
So Ben Graham likened this style of investing to buying your groceries. You know how on the shelves in the aisle, they have little signs that indicate for each brand or size of a product, how much you are paying per ounce or other unit of quantity. So value shoppers look for the most units at the lowest cost, ignoring the pretty label or the new and improved puffery. Similarly, a value investor is skeptical of the little size container of the national brand, preferring to go right to, let's say, your Costco and get that huge box of the house brand, realizing that on a per unit basis, the investor is paying substantially less. You know, a key attribute for us as value investors is to prefer one in the hand versus two in the bush. That means preferring an immediate return on investment versus a deferred return down the road. Well, two in the bush might be nice. Value investors keep a healthy degree of skepticism as to whether that two in the bush will actually turn up. Stories of eventual profits and largesse are looked at with skepticism. Why? You know, that future is always uncertain. So that's one reason we prefer the one in the bush. Second, buying the two in the bush store usually requires paying up, paying more. If the promise of growth doesn't materialize, risk a loss of principal. Hey, value investors kind of like troubled situations, particularly if the issues are short term in nature. You know, many investors tend to overreact to the bad news du jour, shooting first and analyzing later, even though most bad situations will pass. And so you can take advantage of knee jerk pessimism to get otherwise solid businesses on the cheap. You know, what are the examples of bad news that could cause an overreaction? Well, that might be like a strike, litigation, a personnel change. Uh, something happening to another company in the same sector that may not have a direct bearing on the company you're analyzing. You could be more confident on buying on the dip if the reason for the dip will not last forever. You know, we also like to look for a margin of safety. If you're trying to buy a company at a valuation that's less than the valuation of the overall market, if it's a lot less than the market and things don't work out great, you may still end up with a company cheaper than the overall market. So if the overall market trades at, let's say, a 20 PE, and your prospective investments at 10, even if earnings aren't quite as good as hoped, you may still have a company trading at 15, less than the overall market. So what's the ideal investment for a value investor? Oops. Um, well, like most things, uh, no investment is perfect and everything involves trade-offs. Numbers are always on a continuum and there are many shades of gray. You know, plentiful earnings are a must relative to your investment costs. However, if the PE metric is the same for two different companies, the company with the higher market share, the lower debt level, the less cyclicality in the operations, that has a better chance to grow those earnings. And so that may be more attractive. Unfortunately, of course, the PE levels of two different companies are never identical. So the question can come down to how much less in the way of earnings we accept per dollar of investment outlay to get that lower debt level, that lesser cyclicality, that higher market share or those better growth prospects. To make it more complicated, some of the flaws in your proposed investment may actually be opportunities. The company with the lower market share may be able to increase its market share while the company with the high market share may have less chance to grow it and perhaps may be targeted by regulators for being a monopoly. The company with the extra debt may be able to pay it down, but the company with the smaller debt may decide to go on a spending and borrowing spree. You know, often the quality of management is cited as a big issue. And Ben Graham, the Dean of Value Investors, always said, always ignore management's reputation. What? He reasoned that if management was so good, it would already be reflected in the numbers. So to pay even more for the stellar reputation was double counting or overpaying. If the numbers weren't that good, how deserving is that management's reputation? And, you know, another reason for not paying up for the so-called celebrity CEO is that that situation can change fast. I always tell our clients that the only thing worse than investing in a company with poor management is to pay up for the company with the star CEO, only to see that CEO depart after you've made your investment. Let's talk about some mac uh, macro uh, outlook uh, for here in 2022. So, you know, it comes as no surprise to um, uh, uh, listeners of this webinar that inflation is the key issue. Currently, it's the highest in four decades. The last CPI print we received showed prices were 8.5%, higher in 
uh, higher in March than it was a year ago. Half that inflation spike was due, in fact, to energy costs. But if you look at uh, core inflation, there was some reason for optimism as it decelerated a tad in March from February. It was up just three tenths of 1% in March versus February's half of 1%. But those hopes were soon dashed by a hotter than expected producer price index measuring inflation at, at the wholesale level, which showed a rise of 1.4% in March alone. And then we and then we got very hot import price reading up 2.6% March. So, you know, the question is, how long is this inflation going to last and what's the cause? Well, supply side issues, starting with tariffs under the prior administration, then made worse by COVID and now capped off with the Ukraine war are driving it. Quite frankly, there's little the Federal Reserve can do about that form of inflation and maybe little anyone can do. But, you know, we're also getting inflation by excess demand. The Federal Reserve in its efforts to lessen that economic fallout from the pandemic, arguably kept interest rates too low for too long. And along the way, piled up $9 trillion in debt on their balance sheet, fueling in inflation in both asset prices and consumer demand. The recent hawkish rhetoric from the Fed, Federal Reserve members may be trying to reduce demand simply by threatening and or warning of much tighter and higher interest rates ahead without actually having to light that match. Fiscal policy too has been inflationary. You know, our government passed over 5 trillion in spending packages to address COVID-19 and reduce the financial impact on the country. Now it seems that Washington is in a fiscal tightening mode. A good example of that is that Washington is now trying to get the states to cough back to the federal government money sent their way for small business so that Washington has some money to pay for pandemic response purposes. Because the Republicans in Washington said, if you wanna spend more for the pandemic amelioration, you need to offset it by cuts elsewhere. So, you know, all eyes are now on the Fed and what they're gonna do. Most strategists are saying, seeing the Fed hike up to eight times in the next 18 months, including front loading the hikes by announcing several 50 basis point hikes starting as early as next month. Indeed, St. Louis Federal Reserve President Bullard said there is a case to be made for a three quarter point cut in May, and it would be appropriate to target a three and a half percent federal funds rate by the end of the year, up from the current one half of one percent. The thinking is that the Fed um, is that the Fed can't get interest rates above inflation. If they can't do that, there's still basically incentive to keep borrowing to buy, which will continue to put upward pressure on prices. Here's the problem. The Fed rate hikes are a blunt instrument and may first cause deflation in asset prices. Yes, your stock portfolio and real estate before it has an effect on the real economy. Fed rate hikes may ultimately hurt the demand for labor too. Consumer spending, of course, is nearly 70% of the economy. So that uh, would be a real negative. The Russian-Ukraine war is a major negative factor. Its effect is increased the closer you are to the conflict and the more dependent you are on energy from abroad. Fortunately, we are, if you include Canada and Mexico anyway, energy independent. But as energy is a global commodity, prices are moving up fast here. The US is shipping liquefied natural gas as fast as it can to Europe so that it can substitute for Europe, uh, imports from Russia. Natural gas prices there are three times what they are here. Will that cause natural gas prices there to fall or prices here to rise? Unfortunately, it'll probably be a little bit of both. So corporate earnings are projected to stay strong, but the all important outlooks can't help but be muted among the headwinds of inflation, higher benchmark lending rates and geopolitical stress. You know, earnings overall so far uh, following Q1 have been decent with the average S&P company that's reported so far nearly 9% better than expected. It's just that the all important risk premium keeps getting compressed. So what is that? That's the, the comparison between what you can get on the 10 year treasury versus the, the earnings yield on stocks, which is that inverse of the PE ratio. So with the 10 year close to 3% and that S&P trading at just under 19 times or just a 5% earnings yield, you've got, an earning, you've got a risk premium of closer to 2% than the 3% or greater, which most strategists feel compensates you adequately for the volatility of stocks. 
So COVID-19 appears to be waning, but markets must remain vigilant over any new strains. Um, overseas vaccination rates are lower than the U.S., creating a fertile breeding ground for new variants. These could e be easily imported in the U.S. Indeed, this BA2 strain is pushing up cases, causing, for example, the city of Philadelphia, and indeed, even my daughter's college, American University in D.C., to reinstate mask mandates. Another concern is that that inflation rate is moving up faster than um, employees' wages. So that means the real spending power of consumers is shrinking. And as I mentioned, with the consumer being 70% of the economy, that's no small factor. So longer term, yeah, you guessed it. We are bullish. Um, why are we bullish? Well, interest rates, you know, with despite this knocking on the door of 3%, they're still low. And indeed, real rates, when you took the interest rate less the inflation rate, are still negative, creating incentives to chase risk assets. Um, and, um, and of course, that means rotating for bonds into stocks and borrowing to invest in the real economy. Federal Reserve, well, they're talking a hawkish game now, but my guess is they could quickly become dovish if it sees rate hikes as jeopardizing the economy. Uh, just yesterday, um, uh, Bostic, who actually is a, a former voting member of the Fed, talked about inflation is important, but we shouldn't do anything to jeopardize the health of the economy. You know, if some institution fails, that could be enough for the Fed to change its tune quickly. Or alternatively, if we start seeing hiccups in the labor market. Uh, indeed, we may already be seeing that as the Wall Street Journal just reported that a well-known mortgage lender has started to reduce headcount to offset a mortgage slowdown due to higher interest rates. Um, fiscal stimulus, we still think will be readily available because still the mantra in Washington is deficits really aren't hurting us, and it's a small price to achieve a robust economy for all. Uh, you know, both parties talk a fiscal spending game, but if it involves spending proposed by their own party, they don't worry about how to pay for it. Most Americans still don't seem to see any connection between deficit uh, spending and any perceived economic ill. Um, and finally, of course, uh, sentiment has cooled dramatically. A recent poll by the American Association of Individual Investors shows bullishness has declined dramatically. It was 32% three weeks ago, now it's just 16%, while bearishness has surged from 28% to 48%. But on the other hand, uh, we caution our clients, evaluations still are not cheap when you look at the long sweep of history. Quite frankly, the more you pay, the lower your expected return. If you've got a bond that pays 5% annually and you pay 20% over par, it returns down to 4%. Right now, stock valuations are well above long-term historical norms. But then again, interest rates are well below. So let's start to drill down a little bit um, as to what we like and why. Uh, you know, on the right on this screen, we show asset class returns. And if you look at them, each year there's a different uh, array of on the leaderboard. Uh, so, for example, 2007 emerging market stocks um, uh, were at the top of the uh, were at the top of the various sectors, up 40 percent that year. But the following year, High grade bonds were number year, were number one. If you see 2008, up 5.2% emerging, emerging market stocks had fallen over 53%. So what's our point here? Our point is things keep changing each year as to which group performs best. And we don't think anyone can regularly call the year to year winners. So we advise diversification. Um, continuing on that theme, we're going to discuss with you seven stocks and one fund, each of which we believe could be profitably bought and held today. You see the list, uh, Exxon, U.S. Bank Corp, Boeing, Verizon, Bristol Myers, CVS, a fund, an emerging markets fund, and then finally Federal Express. Uh, they are uh, in uh, different categories, and let's get right to it. So we start with energy. You know, and, you know, energy stocks have more similarities than they do differences. So the, the first question anyone would have is, why do you like energy? Well, lots of reasons. We think the most important reason is the demand is going to outstrip supply. So what's driving that demand? Number one is that the globe is climbing out of that pandemic. 
um, which forced people to stay at home, not travel, not get out. During the period, of course, energy use plummeted. No, no jets were flying around, vehicles were in the garage, et cetera. But now with the pandemic on the way, there's tremendous pent up demand to get out. Indeed, our, the airlines are telling us that demand right now for air travel exceeds anything they've ever seen before, at least back in 2018, 2019. Um, of course, factories are humming. The global economy is on the mend. Um, and supply, however, is constrained. The key reason why that is, is that no one's been making any money, giving money to energy companies to invest. The returns on invested capital have been terrible. Energy has been the worst performing sector for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and so capital to do further exploration is quite frankly scarce. Fossil fuels, of course, are finite. Um, in any event, if money is given to energy companies to explore, they want a return on capital. Um, the days when energy companies had carte blanche to just keep reinvesting profits, they are gone. Many companies now have policies that require them to return a set amount of cash flow to the shareholders in terms of dividends or share, buy, share buybacks. Two other reasons are very important. Um, first, many mandates in this country and abroad uh, are requiring companies and uh, users to phase out fossil fuel use. No energy company wants to invest and then have stranded assets. So that really saps incentives to explore. Part and parcel of that is this ESG movement. Many investors, both institution and retail, are shunning fossil fuel investments in order to promote environmental and social goals. That makes capital even harder to raise to finance more exploration. Uh, in addition, less demand um, for these types of stocks and investments makes them cheaper. But that's actually a positive for those willing to invest in the sector. You know, in the 1980s, there was a so-called vice mutual fund, which tended to outperform. Why? It invests in companies most people found distasteful, namely tobacco, alcohol, and defense stocks. The fund typically outperformed because the dividends and profits of these companies were cheaper than the overall market as investors had avoided these sometimes so-called sin stocks. Bottom line, energy stocks are the new sin stocks. They're also a great hedge on inflation, geopolitical conflicts like the Ukraine. Um, so let's get down to our pick here. Um, and that would be Exxon. Why Exxon, okay? Exxon by far the market leader among publicly traded energy companies. First, as an integrated, it's involved in all phases of the business from upstream production and search to midstream, meaning transportation by all means of conveyance. And finally, the so-called downstream operations, which include refining and marketing. There's also in the chemical business. And you know, if its chemical business was broken off from Exxon, it was a standalone, it would be one of the largest on the planet. Exxon is global with more operations overseas than does British Petroleum, BP have uh, in the United States. This business and geographical breadth gives it great diversification, allowing one part of the business to potentially um, carry uh, another part of the business in various parts of the cycle. While Exxon's had a great run, rising almost threefold from around $30 in the last two years, is still below its 52-week high of 92 and well off its all-time high of 102. Exxon is a dividend aristocrat, meaning it's increased its dividend for at least 25 years in a row. Well, 39 years in a row, if you're keeping a precise count. That dividend is now over 4%, making it one of the top yielders in the S&P 500. Finally, most analysts don't emphasize the natural gas business of ExxonMobil. It's a really important business, a substantial income stream for it. And this ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine is driving uh, gas prices to their highest level, in some cases ever, in this country, certainly in a decade. Um, and European countries like Germany are moving away from Russian natural gas and are planning to import more liquefied natural gas from the US. And that really plays into uh, uh, Exxon's strength. Finally, we like the fact that Exxon's really gotten its debt down, that debt to capital ratio, relatively low 21%. And that gives Exxon the flexibility to return money to its investors and shareholders, as opposed to worrying about debt. And indeed, just recently they disclosed a new $10 billion share buyback program 
uh, when it released its full year uh, results from last year. Um, and uh, we think that they will be able to um, uh, finish that repurchase program in a shorter than expected period and even initiate another new share back program in the future. Let's talk about a different sector um, and that would be uh, financials. Why do we like financials? You know, financials are your quintessential value sector, making up a nearly a third of some value indices. Those stocks have been laggards going back to the subprime crisis when the stocks required government bailouts and regulations tightened to ensure the situation did not develop again. Since then, interest rates have been descending. However, one reason we think to be bullish on financials now is that we will, may well be in a period of rising interest rates. Higher rates boost the pricing and the profitability on financials' most important product, loans, and boost net interest margins. Um, as the pricing on the loans tends to go up faster than what the banks are paying on their deposits. But you know, it's not just banks that are gonna benefit from higher rates. You take insurance companies, they have float. Float is the premiums they've received during the period before they're potentially paid out for a claim. Um, and so they're gonna be able to make more money on that float with the higher interest rates. Other financial companies can benefit uh, well from the higher interest rates. Uh, take a company like Schwab, for example, which does not really charge commissions for most stock trades, but makes billions on the low interest rate pays out on its money market funds versus what it can invest those funds in. The higher interest rates go, the wider the margin between its returns versus what it pays out on those money market accounts. Uh, financials are going to benefit from improving the economy. Reserves taken against pandemic era losses can be reversed, enhancing current income. Loan and transactional activity should be on the increase. If the Dems lose um, the House in the midterms, we could set, well see a split government leading to gridlock, reducing the risk of new laws adverse to the politically unpopular financial sector. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Fritz to talk about a potential candidate in the financial sector. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so. We're going to uh, turn it over to uh, U.S. Bank Corp, ticker USB. Uh, you know, we generally view uh, USB as a lower risk, high quality, diversified regional bank. And in fact, it's one of the largest regional banks in the U.S. with 20 different branches. Um, it has a well diversified business uh, across retail and commercial, trust and wealth, mortgages, credit cards, and payments. Um, and you know what we like about USB is that you know it has a little bit less interest rate exposure than a typical regional bank. Uh, due to the larger portion of their revenues coming from, you know, payment processing. Um, about 26% of their revenues come from payment services and 43% come from non-interest income. So, you know, the, the volatility around interest rates, uh, you know, they have a little bit less so relative to, uh, to other regional banks um, and provides a little bit more of a steady stream of income. Uh, you know, they do have very strong, uh, you know, return on capital ratios, uh, you know, especially compared to their peers, such as PNC Financial, uh, and their return on equity, you know, has tended to be in the low to the mid double digits, um, and which is why, you know, we think that it's a, it's a high quality bank, uh, although it does trade at a slight premium to, to other regional banks, um, you know, we, we do feel that uh, you know, it, it does provide a little bit lower risk. Um, you know, their most recent earnings uh, results were, were uh, quite positive. They, they had strong loan growth. Um, they did have, you know, with that exposure, you know, with the exposure that they do have to the, uh, you know, interest rates, they saw an expanding net interest margin um, and a better than expected re reduction in costs. And we do think that they are trading at an attractive valuation. Uh, you know, if we look at, you know, relative to, you know, their historical averages, as well as the broader S&P 500 uh, bank industry group, um, you know, their next 12 months earnings uh, is, is trading at, you know, below one standard deviation of their 10 year average. Uh, and the same goes for their, for their book value. Um, so, you know, we think that there, there are some uh, good advantages in this, uh, you know, large regional bank, and we think it's an attractive opportunity for, uh, for long-term investors. Uh, next slide. Boeing. Um, so yeah, so another, uh, you know, think that another stock that we think is an interesting and a great long-term option is Boeing. Uh, you know, we see bank, 
think that it represents a compelling opportunity to own one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, you know, it's faced several challenges in recent years, um, certainly with the coronavirus pandemic and the issues surrounding the 737 MAX and the 787 Dreamliner jets. Uh, but with uh, CEO Dave Calhoun in his third year uh, at the company, you know, we think that, you know, they've begun a great turnaround. You know, they've had recent approvals from uh, the FAA, the EU, and China for their 737 MAX, and it puts them on track to returning to pre-2019 levels, albeit, you know, over, you know, a couple of years, though. Um, so, you know, we think that, you know, Boeing being one of the two leading airplane manufacturers, you know, operates in a, in a uh, duopoly with Airbus, but also the largest aerospace aerospace and defense contractor in the world, you know, we do think it's a, a, a great long-term option for the portfolio. You know, when we think about, uh, you know, air travel and expectations there, you know, the near-term and, and long-term outlook, you know, still uh, looks good on travel, um, you know, kind of just seeing the, uh, you know, kind of the, the flight patterns and the, um, the foot traffic at airports and the flights, you know, from a business perspective and pleasure perspective, it seems like travel is, uh, is back on the upswing. Um, and, you know, additionally for Boeing, they do have a large backlog uh, in there um, uh, uh, of, of planes that need to be built, which covers several years as well. So a stable revenue uh, perspective. And um, back onto the aerospace defense uh, piece, you know, about 42% of their revenue comes from uh, defense spending. And, you know, unfortunately, in, in our geopolitical climate, that's that's a good thing for, for uh, Boeing, um, you know, where, you know, the U.S. Has, has incrementally increased defense spending, as well as Germany, which had a third increase, uh, and Japan, a 14% hike as well. All things that, bo uh, that bode well for Boeing. Uh, the stock is trading at a relative uh, uh, bargain relative to its history, trading about, you know, about two thirds off of its highs from 2019 and about 25% off from about a year ago. Uh, and yet their fundamentals and their valuations are improving. Uh, 2022 is expected to be a year where, you know, they start to see more free cash flow uh, that, that should turn positive. You know, back during COVID-19, they eliminated their dividend, they reduced or suspended their share buybacks. Um, and so expectations are as, you know, free cash flow turns positive, you know, they get their long-term debt, um, you know, start to pay that down that, uh, you know, you'll see, you know, a lot of the balance sheet um, improve uh, and the valuations as well. And so, you know, we think that it's, it's priced attractively where it is today. Um, certainly has come under pressure recently, given the, you know, what, what happened in China uh, and the crash there, although there's been no indication yet that it was a plane specific issue. Um, and we think that, you know, if there's, uh, you know, if you kind of get rid of Boeing, to rely solely on Airbus is not you know, the way the industry wants to go. And so it does serve uh, a unique role in, in the industry there as well. Um, and then on a price to sales basis, it's trading, you know, under uh, 2.0, which uh, just adds to, I think, the, the attractive level that, that Boeing is trading at. Over to you, David. Hey. Thanks for that, Fritz. So let's talk about Verizon. You know, Verizon's a market leader in what we can't all remove from the palm of our hand, our wireless service. Unlike its baby bell siblings, for the most part, it's stuck to its knitting, focused on providing communication services and avoided those big expensive bets on content like AT&T, a competitor's big bet on content in the form of Warner Brothers. It also avoided a big expensive acquisition like AT&T's bet on satellite with AT&T's acquisition of Dish Network. In the wireless business, um, Verizon holds roughly 40% of the postpaid phone market, about a third greater than either AT&T or T-Mobile. Leading scale enables Verizon to generate the highest margins and returns on capital and industry. You know, uh, the merger of T-Mobile's Sprint has actually improved the industry structure, leaving just three players with little incentive to be irrational about pricing uh, in search of short-term market gains. Um, Verizon perennially wins the consumer surveys and who provides the clearest service, as well as providing the best geographic range. We think all carriers are poised to provide even better service and make more money due to 5G. Uh, Verizon, like the others, has spent billions in acquiring Spectrum to offer this service. 
This ultimately should enhance profitability as ultimately these costs will be passed on to users. Moreover, this should enhance profitability by allowing Verizon to convert some of their less profitable prepaid users into so-called postpaid users. You know, to get this quality and market leadership in a company and a stock, you'd think you'd have to pay up. Not so. Verizon's one of the cheapest stocks in the stock market today, trading at just eight times earnings and a near 5% dividend. If you have acrophobia of today's high stock market valuations, this is your ticket. And indeed, ironically enough, Verizon still hasn't returned to its all-time high set over two decades ago uh, in the dot-com uh, days, although it's continued to pay out its generous dividends since then. And that's going to take us to a healthcare a pick. You know, people say, oh, why healthcare? Healthcare stocks are the other growth stocks, but in the mad dash for all things tech in the last couple of years, healthcare has gotten priced like value stocks. Why? Well, you know, during the pandemic, we loved healthcare, but only if it provided a vaccine, a therapeutic for COVID, or a lab test for the pandemic. Other healthcare was quite frankly neglected, partly because, in point of fact, much of it was deferred. Patients were fearful of entering healthcare settings, afraid of getting COVID, or healthcare settings just didn't have the room to handle them. Fast forward now, and as we all know, we're hopefully and soon getting past COVID. Non COVID procedures are again getting done. Patients are seeking out healthcare. Um, and so, Further, we're all afraid of the war in Ukraine, but we don't think the big biopharma companies are going to be uh, affected by that. Um, they generate less than 1% of their sales from Ukraine and Russia. Um, and so we just don't think it's going to be a big issue. And indeed, in some cases, the sanctions can be avoided by the healthcare companies because critical care medical products are less likely to be limited by sanctions. Um, so despite the S&P 500 trading at close to 19 times earnings, we like these healthcare stocks because we can now get this good growth at a below market multiple. So bring on Bristol Myers Squibb. This blue chip pharma trades at just 12 and a half times earnings with a 10% free cash flow yield and boasts a 3% dividend. It's very skilled in M&A and acquiring other companies and as a result, they built a very strong portfolio of drugs and a solid research and development pipeline. Celgene, which was headquartered here in uh, Summit, New Jersey, prime example that they swallowed up and has really helped build out their pipeline and solidify their wide moat and growth outlook. In particular, we like their new cancer drug, Optivo, and the cardiovascular drug, Eliquis. Uh, this... Uh, Oncology drug Optivo could radically shift uh, several cancer treatments and from an investor's point of view, um, uh, could possibly produce 10 billion in revenue annually. Um, uh, we like the fact that more than half of Bristol's late stage pipeline is centered on immunology and cancer. Why? Those are the drugs get, that get speedier FDA approval because the needs are so great and those are the drugs that tend to get the higher profit margins, which is good from an investment point of view. And now I'm going to turn it back to Fritz. Thank you, David. Um, so CVS Health Corp, uh, CVS, um, you know, it's a, an established leader in, in key segments of healthcare, including, you know, the benefits section, uh, pharmacy and services, and the retail long-term care. Um, you know, what's interesting about CVS is they have started to shift their retail strategy a bit due to the demand for more healthcare services, which is an area of the industry that's growing 5 to 9% annually. Um, so in a, in a recent survey, 71% of people uh, said that they would consider CVS for more health services. Um, and so, you know, in uh, kind of this, what they've been doing for, you know, focusing on over the past couple of years is starting to transition, you know, just a sole pharmacy store starting to create these health hubs, uh, these minute clinics um, where it's kind of a one-stop shop. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of, you know, in, in um, your towns across the U.S., you know, these emergency clinics, you know, CVS kind of wants to, to kind of step into that fray and, and provide more than just, 
you know, your prescription pickup, uh, you know, over the counter drug pickup um, into more of a holistic wealth center. Uh, so to that end, you know, it recently they announced they'll be closing 900 stores over the next three years to align their remaining stores, uh, those, you know, that are a bit lower cost as healthcare destination. Um, and so what that would do is, is help to lower cost um, and help see that the EPS growth uh, accelerates. Um, you know, what's, what's interesting is, you know, you know, their goal in that retail strategy is the pivoting to those three types of stores. Um, you know, they'll have some as the primary care clinic, some as the more of enhanced health hubs. And then meanwhile, uh, many stores will just maintain that traditional pharmacy location. Um, and then uh, as we look uh, further, you know, the, the medium to long-term attractiveness uh, of, the, of, of the stock, you know, they had solid Q4, they beat estimates, um, and uh, though they did give some weak guidance for 2022, uh, you know, the impressive medium-term bottom line growth target was there. And, and there's certainly still some room for upside uh, in the stock this year if we see a fourth booster um, announced. Uh, they do have a, a strong balance sheet, good free cash flow. They're trading at about 12 and a half times forward PE. Um, and, you know, we think overall uh, the company's integrated model uh, is unique in the marketplace and should enable CVS to drive lower overall healthcare costs through uh, data analytics, more effective patient engagement and shifting care uh, to lower cost sites. Um, and so, you know, given kind of what the, their plans for the future um, and, you know, their strong underlying fundamentals, you know, we are, uh, we see uh, good value in, in CVS uh, today. And then the, uh, and then next we have the uh, Vanguard Emerging Markets ETF. Um, and so this is a, an ETF that tracks the FTSE Emerging Markets All Cap China A Inclusion Index. Uh, and so it's called that because a, a few years ago, um, the index added holding locally traded China A shares. Um, it has a, an eight bit expense ratio. So it's a cheap way to get exposure to emerging market across large, mid and small cap from 20 developing over 20 developing nations. Uh, it has about 77 billion in assets under management. Uh, it's yielding about 3% relative to the S&P at 1.3. And so there's some good yield uh, component there. Um, though it is down 19% from its high of last February. Uh, it is showing some relative strength this year, though. Uh, a lot of that has to do to its exposure to, to commodities, which we'll get to in a second. Um, and it does have a 32% exposure to China, which has um, certainly, you know, depressed the, you know, the, the sector or the, the, the industry, the index uh, broadly. You know, Chinese stocks are down about 37% over the last 12 months. You know, they're still contending with uh, U.S. regulators and and the you know de delisting tit for tat, uh, as well as you know the, the effects of COVID nineteen and and new variants, given you know a you know the, the lower rates of vaccination. You know the Chinese shares you know have weighed on the index over the past year, but may present an opportunity for for long term minded investors. Um, you know we we do have to touch on uh, you know Russian stocks here. Uh, you know, prior to the invasion, you know, Russian stocks comprise about 3% of, of the index. Um, and then, you know, after the invasion, Vanguard and, and the index mentioned that they were going to be removing the Russian stocks from the uh, from that, that benchmark. Um, and so the fund still holds less than 1% of its holdings in, in Russian stocks, uh, more, you know, illiquid positions. Um, but, you know, given a 3% starting point, you know, the, uh, the negative impact on performance has been limited. Um, and going forward, they're not going to be adding the uh, the Russian stocks to to that index and and that fund. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, emerging markets you know tend to have higher exposure to commodities, um, which you know, has certainly benefited them in recent months. Specifically, countries like Brazil, which is up thirty percent year to date, uh, Saudi Arabia up twenty percent year to date, and South Africa, which is up ten percent year to date. You know, these are you know uh, you know economies heavily. Uh, you know, uh, involved with commodities and um, it's showing through through their uh, the stock market and into the uh, emerging markets index. So, you know, given some of the uh, extraordinary underperformance of emerging markets relative to broader developed and specifically U.S. stocks dating back to over the past 10 years, you know, we think that, you know, there's perhaps an opportunity here um, to see a prolonged upswing uh, as we, you know, possibly see, a, you know, a geographic rotation out of the U.S. Uh, and into emerging market stocks.
Back to David. So last but not least, uh, we like transports here. Sure, they've fallen out of bed this month with many saying the divergence in their poor performance versus the rest of the market is well ominous, citing Dow theory that says that for the market to do well, the transports must be in sync with the industrials, effectively carrying or taking what the industrials are making. But remember the old saw that the market is called 10 of the last six recessions, meaning that this could easily be a false signal. Further, some of these transports are so cheap that the downside should conditions deteriorate may be less severe than the upside profitable if those fears don't materialize. So, you know, the big thing about FedEx is it's all about the e-commerce. No matter what happens with Russia, Ukraine, or the pandemic, or the Fed, the fact of the matter is over the next five years, more and more people are going to be ordering online. And to uh, get it from those manufacturers and vendors to consumers, it takes a company like FedEx. And, you know, their ground package delivery operations should continue to enjoy these that robust growth tailwind uh, uh, rooted in that favorable e-commerce trend. Um, what we like here is their massive package sortation footprint. That's a combination of their air and delivery fleet and the global operations. And you put it all together, that's almost impossible to duplicate. That's a very big moat with a huge wall around it. You know, during its five year, five decade history, FedEx was founded back in the 70s. FedEx has seen the situations we've seen today with geopolitical issues, higher interest rates, lower interest rates, inflation. And they have been able to weather through it throughout these various economic cycles. So although the short-term results may suffer, that powerful parcel delivery network we think is here to stay and will be very profitable for investors going forward. Consider too, that FedEx is really part of a duopoly. There's just one other competitor, UPS. And when you just have two people controlling a market, that gives you a lot of power. For unlike UPS, FedEx is not unionized. So that actually may be an advantage here in this tight labor market. How about the valuation? It's cheap. 60% of sales is down one third from its 52 week high. It's got a 22% return on equity with a 6% return on assets. So this is a company that, although it's a little dicey now or seems that way, um, if it just gets back up to its 52 week high over the next three years, you're gonna be very, very happy. I'll be a hundred points up. So at this point, uh, this concludes the formal part of our presentation. We so much look forward to have handling your questions. We thank you for your attention. Fire away with the questions. All right, perfect. Uh, first off, um, we have uh, Barry, who's wanting to know if you have any thoughts on Netflix as an investment. <laughs> Well, uh, we are covering our shorts today, uh, uh, but uh, no, seriously, you know, Netflix is the industry leader in terms of streaming. They created the business. They developed some of the best content the world's ever seen, but this is why we always pay attention to valuation. No matter how great a company could be, if you're starting to pay 100 times earnings for it, and it's in the stratosphere, if the slightest thing goes wrong, um, uh, look out below. And of course, we've seen this company go from 700 in the last six months now with a two handle. So that's pretty ugly. So I guess one takeaway from the situation is watch how much you're paying. And you know, it's, it's, the other thing is that it's not just investors who are looking carefully what different sectors are trading at. It's also people in the real economy. So once the other key players, whether that is 
you know, Comcast and, and, and Disney and Amazon and, and Alphabet. And of course, you've got Warner Brothers. You've got uh, now Paramount Communications. Once they saw how attractive streaming was, they're all moving into it because that's where the, the demand was from consumers. And so at the same time, you're paying a lot in the marketplace, their market share is going to start to be attacked. And, and that's what they're finding now. Um, that, you know, Disney Plus offers a good service, is providing pretty good competition. It's not just competition, of course, for eyeballs to consumers, it's competition for the best content talent. You know, if you can come up with a Bridgehampton regularly, you don't have anything to worry about. The problem is those are few and far between, um, and consumers don't really care what service they're using. They want the best shows. And so this shows what happens when you get a lot of competition. It, it eats away at the foundations of your business that coupled with high valuations make it very tricky. I, I was quite frankly surprised at some of the management response. They said, well, you know, maybe we need, uh, or we will work on an ad uh, supported streaming service. Uh, and we should have that out, you know, within perhaps two years. And I think a lot of people are thinking, <laughs> that's what TV is, ad supported content. So why weren't they already ready with this way to solve the problem in advance as opposed to seemingly starting from scratch here? So, you know, I think for all those reasons, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a great company. No one's going to be, for the most part, deleting uh, their Netflix from uh, their, their content screen. I think my, my son may ultimately be forced to have his roommates uh, uh, pay for their own su subscription. But I think it's a word to the investor wary investors out there to avoid paying too much and realize ultimately competition is out there. Fritz, you want to add anything? No, I think I think you make um, all the, the, the right points. Um, and I think there's just a lot of competition out there. Uh, the market's starting to become, you know, certainly flooded with with options and streaming channels. Uh, you know, I was just talking with my wife last week. You know, it's kind of strange having a, 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 a cable subscription where we're getting live cable, but then you've got, you know, you're spending most of your time, whether flipping between, you know, Netflix or, you know, our son loves Disney Plus or, uh, you know, all these different channels have their own streaming yeah. options. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, you know, I think it's just the, the fight for eyeballs and it's starting to hit the bottom line for a lot of these companies. I mean, we've seen just recently kind of the falter of, of CNN plus, uh, and their low sus initial subscriber signups. Um, so it's a, it's a very competitive space. Uh, and maybe that means that, you know, there's, uh, you know, some potential event, uh, opportunities there, you know, whether it's, you know, mergers or acquisitions, uh, to kind of start, start some consolidation in uh, in the streaming place, but no, I think I think otherwise, I think David touched. I think you touched on everything. All right, thank you all so much. Um, we have another question. You touched, uh, you discussed at length your market outlook, but they're specifically wanting to know what your view on the market's valuation is. Yeah, well. Um, it from a historical perspective, it's expensive. It's trading at just under 19 times earnings um, when you know the average over the last 50, 60, 70 years has been uh, mid to lower teens. So it's expensive. So that doesn't necessarily mean you take your, your investment cash and put it under the mattress because you know cash accounts, Money markets are yielding practically nothing and interest rates are very low. So I think at the end of the day, it's all about looking at the valuation on stocks versus your alternatives. And since the alternatives are very expensive too, I think you can justify paying um, a higher price uh, in the market. Of course, computers every day are looking at that 10-year treasury yield, the yield on corporates, comparing it to that P.E., and earnings yield on stocks and making a decision. And things have been deteriorating a little bit, but with bond yields coming up. So it's something we're watching very carefully. But, uh, um, uh, you know, of course, the other thing is, is what are you getting for um, uh, 
uh, paying those high valuations. And in many sectors, including like healthcare, as we talked about, I think you have a, a pretty good uh, uh, growth in, in profits and cash flow and dividends going forward. And the other thing, of course, to keep in mind is that certain areas of the market, we would probably highlight smaller companies, particularly smaller uh, value companies are trading at significant discounts of the overall market valuation. And those are fertile areas for an investor to look at. Fritz? Uh, no, I think I think it touched on, on everything there. Um, you kind of look at just the equities, but, you know, look across the landscape uh, and get a sense of, you know, kind of what's the overall uh, level of valuations across asset classes and, and what the expected returns are. Um, and uh, I think David, David made some great points there. All right. Thanks, y'all. Um, we have another question. Let's see. Uh, towards the beginning of the presentation, David, you mentioned star leaders in relation to corporate management. What are some of your criteria um, for what a star leader is? Yeah, great question. You know, if I take a page out of the legendary Dean of Value Investing, Benjamin Graham, he would say, go right to the financial statements. If you see a track record of uh, growing uh, revenues and sales with uh, outstanding profitability, keeping expenses down, um, what else do you need to know about the leader? Um, it doesn't matter how good his uh, golf game is or how well he tweets. If the financial report statements are good, that is all you need to know. Um, uh, you know, having said that, of course, there always is the, um, you know, inspirational aspects. I mean, you know, I look at Tim Cook and, and you know, how he has calmly, without a lot of drama, uh, steered Apple, particularly in, in, in the wake of his famous predecessor, um, and stayed on message, um, had built, developed strong relationships uh, with uh, his stakeholders, but also made regular trips to Washington. And, and whether it was when uh, President Trump was in office or now with, with Biden has developed strong relationships there. So he is you know, very skilled at doing what's the right thing for his company over the long haul. And, and I think that's impressive. Fritz? Yeah, I think um, you could also look at, you know, specifically, um, you know, the length of tenure uh, of a manager, you know, you, you look at the, the, uh, his legendary Jack Welch of, of GE, who's at the firm, uh, for around 20 years before he retired, um, and considered one of the best managers of, uh, of all time, you know, the length of tenure of, of not just the CEO, but the top management, you know, the quality of that, that team, I think plays, uh, you know, a big factor. Um, you, know, you also want to kind of get a sense of, you know, compensation and you know, maybe not be a direct uh, mark of a, of a good leader, but, you know, from a company perspective, you know, how are the high executives being paid? Um, are they, are there, are they aligned with the interests of the company? Um, and then, you know, to that end, kind of, you can look at, you know, what's some of the insider buying and stock buyback approach been. Um, so that, that kind of gives you some additional things to look at and consider when evaluating kind of the management and management style uh, of the company. All right. Thank y'all. Um, all right. Let's see. Another question says, uh, I'm going to kind of combine two of these questions. Um, it says, what key profitability metrics do you look for? And uh, do you like the best? And which ones do you like the best? Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Sydney. Um, so certainly, you know, return on invested capital, return on assets is pretty powerful. Um, because that basically shows, given a certain amount of capital, how much profitability can you generate? That's as opposed to just merely return on equity, because return on equity shows, you know, how much profitability you're, you're generating with the shareholders capital. But let's face it, if you generate at 10%, but you've leveraged that equity up 10 times with uh, 10 times as much debt as equity, that's less impressive than if you generated a high return on equity without using any debt at all. So certainly um, a, a broader measure that looks at all the assets that a company has to work with and what's the profits generated on that, I think uh, speaks a little bit better than just what you're doing with a small, with a small portion of the capital structure that may be heavily leveraged. 
Fritz, any thoughts? Um, no, no additional thoughts, David. Uh, yeah, those are the ones that 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 you know we we think are pretty powerful and that we we look at. But well, we really do look across all all the profitability measures and valuations there. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, here's an interesting one. They want to uh, you touched you touched on uh, inflation, but they want to know your thoughts on stagflation as well. Yeah, stagflation. That's uh. Uh, that's to be much avoided. You know, when people think of stagflation, they think of the 1970s when basically the Dow uh, stayed or, or was at the same level, I think in the beginning of the 80s as it finished the, the end of the 60s. Uh, so it was a, a pretty ugly period. And stagflation is basically sluggish growth, but still prices rising faster in the overall economy than you would like. So people are talking about it now, and I think one of the reasons is that they see a lot of the inflation coming from things that are outside policymakers' control. We've talked about a few of those. Those would include, you know, COVID-related delays, where you know those ports are all backed up because the uh, longshoremen and, and other workers uh, aren't showing up for work or are afraid to participate. Um, delays getting goods out of China because of the lockdowns there as they pursue a, a zero tolerance for, for COVID policy. And of course, the, the horrific Russia-Ukraine war uh, where um, you know Ukraine was called the breadbasket of, of, of Europe. And so therefore, commodity prices, wheats and grains are skyrocketing. And of course, I think Russia is responsible for about 10% of the world's fossil fuels. So prices are going up there and there's nothing any, anyone can do about it. And you got the Fed feeling under pressure to do something about it. And so as they increase interest rates, it will have, there's no question about it, it will break the pace of economic growth. It will make housing more expensive. It will make borrowing more expensive. It will uh, make buying a car on, on with a loan or a lease more expensive. And so it was going to curb growth, but it may not do much for inflation to the extent that it's, it's supply side driven. And so that's where this stagflation comes into play. And it's, it's, it's frustrating and does not produce great stock market returns as a general proposition or higher than average multiples. And it's hard to work your way out of. Fritz, thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as you know, we've been, been reading for the past couple of months and, and seeing, you know, the, the biggest concern is uh, obviously the inflationary aspects of, of what's going on in the, in the economy, but uh, the supply side, uh, you know, the, the logistics and the, uh, the, the supply chain logistics are kind of breaking down. Um, the hope is that that kind of resolves itself um, and the economy continues to kind of see the growth that, that we've seen over the past, you know, certainly, you know, we're not going to have, you know, high single digit growth uh, that we've seen over the past couple of years, just during from the rebound of, of COVID. Um, but certainly, you know, some, some strong, stable growth uh, to help counteract and then the supply chain, you know, kind of issues resolve. Um, and, you know, that that's, you know, we, we can avoid stagflation, but certainly a lot of eyes are on kind of all of the, the various, you know, counterbalances of, of you know, the, the, the not just US economy, but global economy. All right, thank you. I think this is going to be our last question. Uh, but essentially, what advice do you have for uh, investors who are just starting out, especially in the context of, you know, high inflation, high interest rates, and then this conflict in, uh, in Europe? Um, what are your, what's your advice? Okay, well, you know, when you say just starting out, I guess it implies a, perhaps a younger person, which means to, you know, to understand that, you know, you're pr presumably saving for very long-term goals. Quite frankly, you're going to see a lot of, uh, unfortunately, geopolitical crises before you may be tapping into those funds if you've got a long work life ahead of you and you're saving for retirement. And therefore, not to get too caught up in the news story du jour and get too frozen. So that's one piece of advice. The second piece of advice is, we naturally do worry about whether this is the right time. And one thing, one strategy that people can always pursue is to take your money and divide it into, I don't know, maybe 10, right? And perhaps every month for 10 months in a row, 
you put one tenth of what you have to invest in. So you so-called dollar cost average. So maybe um, uh, the market goes down next month. You've only put one tenth in this month. You can buy in at a lower price or the market soars next month. And you have the satisfaction of knowing that at least you got a little bit started and taken advantage of the rise. And, and, and finally, of course, is, you know, the dirt of the little secret to this business is you can't invest unless you have something to invest. So you got to start by developing a strict savings plan. If you don't save, there's nothing to work with. So um, uh, don't let the, the concern about having the very best investment let you take the eye off the fact that you need to, when your paycheck or other source of income comes in, carefully move a nice chunk of that into the long-term savings account and investment account as opposed to current expenditures. And that will get you pointing in the right direction fast. Fritz, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, just very simply um, getting invested is is the best way to, to get invested and, and not to kind of, you know, belittle the the risks and the hesitancies and kind of maybe more of the, the behavioral side of it. But, um, you know, historically, you know, there's, you know, over a longer period of time, um, you know, it's, it's never a bad time to get invested. Uh, you know, if we think about, you know, you can kind of, everyone's worried about kind of jumping in at the wrong time, but a lot, a lot of the times you see that and, and, you know, the, the not jumping in and not, not getting invested ends up hurting you longer and, uh, longer down the road. Um, and I'd say, uh, you know, one of the, the beautiful things about kind of the, you know, 401k plans today and the, the auto invest and withdraw from your paycheck is that it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, automatically going into an investment account and you can allocate it um, in an, a as conservative or aggressive manner as you'd like. And I think um, taking that same mentality to, to investing outside your 401k, maybe having like an auto uh, sort of contribution to a taxable brokerage account or something, to get started, because um, I think the 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 beautiful thing about long term investing is the compounding aspect, and uh, you know the sooner you start getting invested and you keep adding to it, um, you know your your long term growth is really going to benefit you the the sooner you start. Thank you both so much. Um, well, David and Fritz, that's all we're going to have time for today. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for coming to share your thoughts with us and for taking time to answer questions from our audience. Uh, if anybody missed anything, like I said, there's a full recap of this presentation as well as their past appearance for Value Investing Live available here on YouTube as well as on Guru Focus. That's all we have time for today. So we do wish you all the best with your current and future invest investments. See you all next time. Thank you.